Greetings, listeners, and welcome to The Spiritual Experience, a show where we share stories of life, love, and redemption for all of humanity on Earth. So sit back and enjoy. Try to identify with the speakers and not compare. Don't forget to subscribe on all podcast platforms. I'm your host, Jay Lewis, and here we go. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back, Spiritual Experience. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day, a wonderful life. Happy New Year. We've, uh, yeah, man, we're doing the thing. We're doing it. We're doing it. So um, I got one of, my, uh, one, of my, one of my newest boys I only met in the last couple of months. But, uh, you know, somebody, when, it's, when you're around the, the right people, um, you know, they're always connected to other people who are the right people. And then you can make instant connection uh, right away for people who take their life seriously, their recovery seriously, and all that other kind of stuff. And it's almost like like you've known each other forever. So I couldn't wait to have the guy on. I've been chasing him for know, a couple of weeks or whatever. And now he's here. Frank the Tank. Everybody say hello to Frank. Frank, say hello. What's up, everybody? All right. First thing starts, Frank, where are you from? Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, in uh, Bay Ridge, and uh, grew up back and forth over to Verrazano. Uh, my parents bought a house in Midland Beach when I was like five, and I created havoc over that Verrazano <laughs> bridge. Get yeah. into trouble in one place, go to the other place. Get in trouble over there, come back. Nice. Is it only you, or do you have siblings, or what was it like? I got two, uh, two sisters. All right. Are you old? Uh, Where are you? I'm the oldest. Oh, I'm, boy. I'm the boy. Yeah? <laughs> so what was it like uh, growing up, going back and forth like that? Uh, it, w- it was all right, you know. Um, you know, it was good. Uh, it, Staten Island was tough because uh, I had my whole family in Bay Ridge. Right. So, Which is tough also because, uh, you know, everybody knows you. You're getting banged out for things <laughs> without even knowing somebody's seen you. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So when did uh how how were you doing in school stuff like that? Were you a good student? Did you play sports when you were a kid? Yeah. When I was uh, I actually started school early. Me and my sister are Irish twins. Nice. We're born in the same year, eleven months apart. <laughs> so uh, that's official Irish twins. Right. <laughs> and uh, so I started early. I took a test and got into school early because my mother didn't. Uh, I guess I was smart, and my mother didn't want us in the same class. So I started, and uh, I could have skipped a couple of grades. My mom didn't want me to because she was worried about uh, me being like the little guy in, uh, in like, high school. And, you know, I don't have to worry about being the little guy. <laughs> you know? It's so but funny. I couldn't even imagine you being little. <laughs> Frank the Tank is not like, it's not an accident that you have that name, you know? So, did you play sports at all or anything like that? Yeah, as a kid, I uh, played football, played hockey, you know. Uh, for me, that, that stuff kind of, uh, you know, helped me to maintain somewhat discipline. You know, I had to be at practices. I had to be at, uh, you know, games and things like that. So, I wasn't always running around early on when a lot of my friends were. Right. Were your parents involved in that kind of stuff, too? No, like, not really. My dad was a, a hard worker. You know, I was just talking about it with a guy, and uh, he would work, and he would come home, and he would do his thing, and, uh, you know, he had dinner in his room, and, uh, you know, we kind of kept away from him, and, you know, he brought his check home, and that was it. You know, when I was playing hockey, and, uh, you know, I'm playing goalie, and my mom would be the one out on the corner taking slap shots at me for the practice. That's nice. That's really, that's, that's an incredible, uh, it's an incredible memory to have. Not everybody's mom is going to get out there with their kid, you know? Yeah. My mom, my mom was the lady that, like, fixed the car. Like, I know had a, I've, 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 tra- I've changed a transmission on a street. No way. Yeah, yeah. You know, my mom was the lady that, like, you break down, and you call her, and, like, how to, you, what's going on? Oh, it's probably the starter. Hit it with a, hit it with a hammer. No you way. Know? <laughs> what, what years were this? When were you born? Uh, I was born in the late 70s, and, uh, you know, so this is all, like, 
80s stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 80s when everything was like mechanical. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember many a morning, you know, the car won't start. I'm out there holding the screwdriver in the manifold so that the, you know, air is getting to the carburetor so we can start the car and mom can drive us to school. One time I remember my parents, my, my dad, I don't know why, but he loved like these, I don't know, we had so many Volvos. They were like fucking horrible. Either way, but one time because it was... uh. You know, and I don't know anything about cars except for how much they cost. Uh, but, you know, the car wouldn't start and I had to push the car because it was a stick shift. And then he'd do like the karate kid thing and it would turn on. But I remember I was so embarrassed because I had to do that. I was in seventh grade and we were at one of my one of my boys, uh, this kid, Day Day. He had a bar mitzvah and they took like. 20 kids to fucking medieval times, which like, bro, you when you were at medieval times back then, that was it. This is like early 90s. So like the bus comes back to the where the school is at and uh, my dad shows up in the car, ain't going to start and everybody else has got this kind of car. And I'm like, we have this fucking thing. And I push it and it pops on and, you know, and then that was, uh, that was something that stayed with me to this day. I was a little embarrassed about it. So that's the only thing I know about how to start those kind of cars. But um, popping the clutch. Yeah, I guess whatever that is, <laughs> I don't know. My father was always the guy trying to find a deal. Yeah. Still to this day, he's on that Facebook marketplace. Yeah. Looking for stuff. And he bought a Yugo when Yugoslavia was making these little like uh, matchbox type car things. Wow. It was like. I think he paid for it outright for like four G's, no <laughs> you way. know, car right off the thing. And the same thing, that car, I, you know, I couldn't have been nine years old and I'm pushing a car down the street to pop the clutch because yeah. it was ma- manual. It's crazy. So when did, uh, when did uh, drugs and alcohol, that kind of stuff start seeping into your life? Do you, were you, did you come from a house where people drank and, and then did whatever? Yeah, it was always going on in, in my house, you know, drinking. Drinking always seemed like a good time, though. You know, we would get together, a pretty good, good-sized family. And uh, my mother's family, I remember we would get together, so many cousins, and, you know, they'd be partying. And it was so easy to, to dip off with a 12-pack and go into wherever... Wherever they weren't, the attic, the basement, the garage, the mm. woods, down the street. And I was with my cousins, and we were having a great time, and, and that was awesome, you know? It, uh, you know? They always made it seem like fun, you know? For some reason, the, the women in my family, and my fo- especially on my mother's side, they don't seem to pay consequences for their actions, you know? Like, I remember one time my mom gets... My mom and my aunt are drinking and driving in Florida, and they get pulled over in a in a, a, a convertible flying down a road somewhere, and the cop thinks they're like mules or something. No so way. So he pulls them out and checks them. There's no drugs or anything, but they're shit-faced, and they got my little cousin with them, and all this guy does is like, listen, sit down here by this tree for an hour before you get back in. Right. I don't get those kind of options when I'm out there drinking. I can't mind my own business, so. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. I mean, back then, like, you know, my mom would drink and drive at the same time. (laughs) You know? There'd be little cans of Budweiser. She'd be driving. She could still operate the stick. You know what I'm saying? And we'd be coming and going. Like, what? it was just a different time. So I, like you, I didn't... You know, it wasn't like always dishes flying and people fucking going crazy, you know? The drugs brought that out more, I think. You know, like we'd be at that same party and, you know, not knowing when to go home, (laughs) you know, and eventually there's, you know, ants are fighting with uncles and whatnot and, you know, everybody, you know, people are disappearing in groups into the bathroom, you know, and so for me, I always equated the drugs as being like, you know, steer clear of this, this is going to be bad. And uh, the drinking just was like good times. Right, so when did you start drinking? Uh, The first time I remember, like, me drinking for, like, 
for me, you know, besides like those parties and because that was going on from when I was a little kid, you know, like we'd had 13 year old cousins and you'd be five and they'd make you drink a beer. So yeah. you couldn't rat anybody out. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and then make we, you a co-conspirator. <laughs> exactly, we just continued down that route with the little cousins as we got older. Right. And uh, but for me, I think I was like um, like eleven. I had moved back to Staten Island after uh, you know we we were in Brooklyn for a few years. You know, uh, my my dad had gotten sober. He he went away and got sober and. Uh, we were living with my grandma, and uh, we moved back to Staten Island, and I wanted to, like, reinvent myself. Like, even though I knew these people from the first four years of school, like elementary school, right? that little break away, being with my family and, like, kind of, like, running around and being something, I wanted to carry that over, and drinking was the way to do it. And a kid asked me, uh, you know, hey, you want to get 40s after school? And I said, yeah, not even knowing what was what. I right. just agreed, and and we went down to the local liquor store, maybe like seven blocks from the school, and we asked this dude, uh, who we called at the time Mikey the Bum, you know, Mikey, could you get us a couple of 40s? And, you know, he did what probably I did later on in my drinking career, just did what I had to do to get the next one. Yeah. And even if it was buying a couple of eleven year old kids some forties, that's what that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I remember that that kind of stuff too. But also back then, like once you had I don't know, once I was in junior high, seventh grade, eighth grade, there were places you can go to just buy whatever you wanted. Yeah, we had a place <laughs> later on, maybe a couple of years later, we had you know fake IDs we had made on 86th Street that said I went to, like, Buffalo University or some shit. Right. And, you know, as long as you showed the guy something... Yeah. Uh, you know, you're walking out of there with whatever, you, whatever order you placed. But that, that time with Mikey, we... He goes in, he gets us the 40s, and it's... Uh, uh, he's like, what do you want? We don't even know. Yeah. So, 40s. <laughs> you know, so he comes out with... I, I, I love to tell people, the finest assortment of malt liquor. It nice. was a, a, an OE, a, a Ballantine, and a Colt 45. Oh, my God. And, and we went and hit him in the woods and waited until it got dark and went out and got, uh, you know, started drinking. Yeah. What was it like for you? For me, that, that night, I, like, I still remember it. I didn't remember it for years, and then now it's like it's a focal point. Because we went and got those 40s, and we went behind the old Protestant church. You know, there was like a courtyard fenced in, me and this kid. And I tell people, now I could, I could say it was like a transformational point because I went from feeling inferior to that kid. You know, I just wanted him to be my friend, you know. Uh, and we had these 40s, and once... I went from that that feeling of like inferiority to once we were drinking together, we were on the same playing field. And by the time those 40s were done, I wanted to go on to the third one. And I caught him spilling the foam out from the, you uh. know, the warm beer from the first one. And I'm like, what are you doing hanging out with this loser? That's where my brain goes. Uh, yeah. I'm better than you already just from drinking. Right away. Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't even. Did, were you conscious? Of like, okay, my dad got cleaned up, and here I am in the woods drinking beer. Or it didn't even you didn't even make the connection. Nah, I didn't even make the connection because I, I thought he he got cleaned up from drugs. Right. You know that was one thing. Like my mom always kept drinking. You know, it was never like that support. Like, all right, you cleaned up your act. I'm gonna I'm gonna clean up my act, and we're gonna do what's best for the kids. It was like, all right, you had a problem, you took care of it, and. I don't have a problem with it. Right. You know, my mom still doesn't think she has a problem with it. And maybe she doesn't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's like a self-diagnosis. Yeah. Even though we're always like the last one to know. Plenty of people had a problem with my drinking and drugs <laughs> before I did. Right. And yeah. I didn't do anything until I do. I had a problem with it. Right. So then what was the progression like for you? It was quick. I went from, 
I, you know, why am I hanging out with this loser? <laughs> to, uh, you know, getting the fake IDs and getting the stuff myself. And uh, one night hanging out, I run into that kid's brother. He had a bunch of brothers, you know, all cool kids. Always seem. I grew up with like the in a poor neighborhood, but they always seemed like they had it together. It took me years to realize that. All right, yeah, they got all this gear because there's three or four brothers and they're sharing the gear. <laughs> you know, there's right. a, they got four different pairs of Jordans, but. You know, the guy's never wearing the same Jordans. But he only has one pair of Jordans. He shares them with his brother. That's hilarious. And I was all on my own. So yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Uh, the KRS-One song, Love Is Gonna Get You. Yeah. You know, two and a half pairs of pants, you ain't cool. <laughs> you know, that's with me. I had, you know, just the, only, the gear I had. Right. Yeah, so it's like. You know, a little bit at a time, you start noticing other people, and then you're like, "Wait a minute, I don't, I don't have what they have, but I want to be how they are." So I guess I'm gonna do what they're doing. And then I jumped in with that kid, and they were smoking weed that night. My dad had always, even, even when he went away, it didn't take long for him to be back on the marijuana maintenance program. Right. And you know, there was always access to it, so I smoked with these guys. I didn't even get high the first time, you know. I was just doing it to do it because they were doing it. Right. And then that's it. It took off. Yeah, you know? I got high like maybe the fourth time that I smoked weed. I was pretty persistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I knew you know? it worked. I was like, My old man wasn't wasting time doing this because yeah, it doesn't I was like, work. Yeah, like I was, like, I was like, you know, eventually, I guess. And when it worked, it fucking worked. Oh, yeah, yeah. For me, that was it. And even that progressed kind of quickly to... Uh, you know, I grew up in a bad neighborhood. My neighborhood was like... Uh, in what, was, what was the name of your neighborhood? In, uh, it was Millen Beach in Staten Island. Okay. And uh, and it was like kind of like a layover station for the people from the South Shore that didn't really want to go into Brooklyn to get what they needed to get. Right. So they come and dealt with us yeah. instead of going to the hood to get it themselves. Right. And... Uh, it's like the white guy selling dope in the wire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or it was like a mixed neighborhood, but it was like all like, you know, lack of a better term, trash. Right, <laughs> you right, know? right. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, uh, they would come there, they would get the stuff. So now I'm, I'm, you know, this is a time of New Jack City and King of New York. And now I'm hanging out with the crack dealers because right. I'm not a fiend. I'm not going to be a fiend. Uh, and I'm st now I'm stealing my father's car to do re-up missions in Washington Heights, like playing real-life Grand Theft Auto right. long before the game came out. Yeah. And I loved it. Yeah, that's, that was, you know, you go. that's like going from white belt to, like, brown belt. You skipped all the belts in between. And you blink, and it's like that. You know, that... When you're lost, you know, in that, you know, I first started stealing my parents' car. I was like 12 or 13. By the time I was 15, I was riding around in stolen cars. So it went for me like, quote, the, 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 the clip at that time was called joyriding. If they catch you driving under 16 and it's like you're joyriding. But like, no, then... My friends were stealing cars, and I, we were stealing cars, and I was driving around in stolen cars. Like, the progression, you look back, you're like, holy shit. You know, here I am. I can't even grow a full beard, and I'm, and the life has me doing these things. Yeah, you know? this is all before I'm out of high school. Yeah. You know, I'm, now I'm carrying guns and beating up neighbors for coming up short and shit like that, and it just was like, they accepted me. So uh, I was all in. Right. You know? Yeah, what happens next? Uh, now, you know, that life gets real, real quick. And now there's like a, you know, there's a couple of factions and, you know, warring or whatever. And, you know, the one guy got his pit bull's head cut off and put in the toilet bowl in his house to send a message. And yeah. people are getting locked up. And, and uh, I end up in summer school for... Uh, to get my diploma, because I stopped going. To, once I didn't have to be eligible anymore to play sports, uh, 
you know, you have to maintain a certain grade to get on the field. Once that didn't exist, I stopped going. Right. So my, I did all the school I had to do up until uh, the, like, last six months of my senior year. And then I become, like, a professional handball player. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm at the courts. I'm drinking. I'm, I'm at lunch three, four periods a day. And, you know, so I end up in summer school. And while I'm in summer school, uh, you know, the, the street is getting hot. Uh, I end up meeting this kid who is, uh, he's writing graffiti and stuff like that. He's looking for somebody to be the lookout. You know, if I'm going to smoke with you, I'll hang out. We'll smoke. I'll be the lookout. You do your thing. You know, every once in a while, I'll throw something up. Real trash, but I'll throw up some garbage. Right. And uh, this kid was getting his diploma so that he could go to boot camp. He had already signed up with, the with the, like, the delayed entry program for the Marines, and he was going to boot camp. So one day after school, I was like, yo, you want to go chill? He's like, I can. I got to meet this guy. And why don't you come with us? We're going to the mall. And that was it. I went there with the, 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 the recruiter and this kid to the mall. And this guy's got the blues on. And every girl in the mall is coming up to talk to this dude. And I'm like, I can chill with this dude. I was like, right. I'm not going to boot camp, but I'll chill with you for a minute. And, you know, <clears throat> next thing you know, a couple months later, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to boot camp. You know, I'm... Uh, I was playing football and I was big, so I had to lose like forty pounds just to go to boot camp. Right. This they guy, have like those. What are they called? Like the requirements, the measurement, whatever it is. Right. Yeah, like the minimum uh, accepted for you to get in. Right. And uh, yeah, you can't just be big and fucking stupid. Even if you're huge, you know, yeah. and cut up, they don't want you. you I, I have cousins that are like that. Shout out to them, North Carolina. <laughs> but they're like they're just naturally big fucking kids, and like. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter. Like, you know, you got to be, yeah. They, so, uh, you have to fit the metric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they know there's a, like, if they have you in this area, they could get you to this area. You know, right. the, when I went to boot camp, there was various different size people. You know, little skinny guys, big guys. Got, you know, I got, went with a couple of kids that were McDonald's All-Americans that ended up playing ball for the, for the core, traveling. You know, their job became we play basketball against other bases. Wow. And these kids, uh, you know, all these different sizes. But when it's all said and done and you're graduating, everybody's the same. Wow. What, yeah. what, what, was, what was it like? At, how did you show up at home like, hey, by the way, I signed these fucking papers, just I, so you know. I was still 17, and I had to get my mother to, to sign me in. What did she, she think? She was like, no, absolutely not. You know, you're not going. And she's like, why don't you go to the Air Force? I says, because this guy said the Marines are the best. I knew nothing about it. Yeah, yeah. But the guy told me, he was like, if you're going to do it, why not be the best at it? That's so funny. I heard the recruiters, they're like, they'll give a stockbroker a run for his money. Man, yeah. they fucking sell you, boy. This guy had, a, a, he showed me his degree in sales <laughs> that no he way. had gotten from recruiting duty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's the thing. I've, I, I experienced that, I think, was it my son? I think it was my son. He came home, because my son went to Utrecht, right? And, you know, they send those guys to Utrecht to put on a fucking presentation, you know, on stage. My son came home, and I was like, I don't know, dog. <laughs> say, but he ended up not doing it. But I can, I, 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 we're grateful for the military, 100 million percent. But those guys, that's their fucking job. Yeah, yeah. You get a special duty. You get to go somewhere else that you're not in the, in the mix because you have the gift of gab and you can yeah. sell, you know, ice cream to an Eskimo. So and, your mom signs you in. Then what happens next? Um, you're in boot camp. Yeah, I'm in boot camp. What was that like for you? Uh, for me, it was awesome. I loved it. It was like... Uh, what, year, what year was this? Late uh, 90s? Was this before uh, September yes, 11? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mid-90s. Nice. So, uh, yeah, for me, it was good, you know? Like, uh, I remember you lined up and, and there's like grown men, you know? Because you could go anywhere from 17 years old. I think there was one kid younger than me there. He was still 17. I was 18 by the time I went in. And all the way up to like 28 years old, like 
grown men, like a like one man one man I remembered, you know, turned out to be a good friend of mine, but he was like he was a, a grown man, you know. I had to fight this guy in a uh, in like a uh, they make basically like a phone booth. They make you go into a little thing and pa 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 and I kicked the shit out of this guy and he was a grown man. Nice. You know, but here you are, you're with all these people and there's grown men crying because the guy's yelling at them. Mm. And for me, in my mind, I was like, my dad yells at me every day. I'm good. I can do this shit. Right. You know, and, and luckily for me, the recruiter that I had, he never bullshitted me. He never promised me anything. He said, all I'm going to promise you is a different way of life. And I heard a lot of guys get promised a lot of shit, money, jobs that they weren't qualified yeah. for. And, and here I am. He told me that. He said, it's all... It's a script, you know, there's a playbook. Every recruiting class, these guys aren't, you know, one guy's the bad guy, one guy's the good guy, you know. And once I caught on to it, I just started volunteering myself. Like if they would come after you to, uh, you know, would say smoke you up on the quarter deck, you'd go up there and they'd make you do a bunch of, you know, calisthenics until you were ready to puke. I started volunteering myself and going up there. And the guy was like, what are you doing up here? I said, well, if my brother's up here, I'm up here. And they got a respect for me because I did it every single time. Wow. You know? And it was a great, it was a great experience, you know? I, I thrived in that environment. Right. Because somebody was telling me what to do every the, I was always looking for that, you know? My parents were working and doing their thing, and we you were needed free. needed that structure. Yeah. And once I'm being told what to do every single minute of the day, I'm great. Yeah. Good thing you didn't end up in prison. Yeah. You do the same thing over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but also, the military, I know, these guys, they drink in there, bro. Yeah, once I got out, that, that's where my, my, my shift went. It went from... You turned a corner? Yeah, I remember it clear as day. Just like I remember me drinking the 40s with that kid... I was doing so well, and we're out one night. Now we're in this next level after boot camp. You get out, you go home, you hang out with your family, you come back for this, like, it's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's like all the next skills you need besides the basic training. And there's guys I know that are, you know, going on a run of their own free will just because they want to be better and ready for the next test we're going to have. Run. He's talking about physical run, not like on a fucking drug run. No, no. Full on like uh, half marathon in the middle of the night is so great. We're going to go run for five miles. Yeah. And these other dudes were ordering Domino's and getting 40s. And I just went right over to Domino's and 40s. Mm. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened next? You know, before long, uh, you know, um, I'm drinking till it's time to get up and run in the morning. You know, we would go out, drink, and I'd be putting away a couple of 40s a night. And, you know, I started, uh, you know, you're with people from all over the country, so you start to, to mess around with liquor. It took me a while before I'm messing with the liquor, but I'm making like, uh, you know, I'm putting fruit punch in, in, in the Sainide so that yeah. I can pound it down faster and, you know, Next morning, I'm getting up and going on a five-mile run, and I'm puking as I go. And that was kind of okay because it was like, as long as you don't make them stop. Because if you stop and you're, like, keeling over and crying and pitying yourself and vomiting, everybody else has to run around you in a circle. So they're not getting that. That time's not counting towards their five miles. And, right. And you don't want to make people angry with you because you're making shitty decisions. So... I would just cock my head to the side and projectile vomit. And some days I was the guy getting vomited on, and some days I was the guy vomiting on people. Right. But I didn't make everybody else stop, and I kept going. Yeah. That sounds like serious shit. <laughs> so what comes after all that stuff? Uh, you know, after a while there, now you're on to your real job. And I gra same as I gravitated to the 40s and the pizza, I start gravitating to people that are scheming on the piss test and things like that. And... I didn't want to, I love smoking weed, but I didn't want to smoke weed because that's in you for the longest. You know, I was scared to do coke and other stuff, but pills were, you know, cool. 
You know, I would hang, start it out with like shit you could get in a gas station. You know, like this guy would tell me, oh, yeah, you know, you eat these and you drink and you, you know. And I would go to the gas station like five miles out of town because they were already sold out all around town. Right. And buy the whole box, you know. And it was like uh, speed and whatnot. Like, uh, everything the truck drivers loved. Yeah, <laughs> we the no dose. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, that stuff, yeah. So then I started to, you know, I'm not proud of it, but I became what in the call we like to call a sick bay commando. And I would go, if you got a certain pill, and I happen to notice in your room, you got the one with the droopy eyeball or something like that, I'd be like, how do you get this? Uh -huh. And I would go the next day, and I'd be sick, and I would tell the doctor the same thing you told me you had so that I could get those droopy eyeballs. Uh, uh, do not drink, you know. I remember I would wait. I first thing I would do when I had those bottles would, at the end of the day, I would go get something to, to drink with. You know, if it said, do not eat on an empty stomach or whatever, I'd fast all day before I ate that shit. Because right. in my mind, that was for like, that's for like pussies who can't handle it, you know? Or yeah. A real man who wants to feel the effects of this shit. Of course. You do the exact opposite of what this bottle says. Now, was anybody trying to intervene if they're seeing this kind of shit going on, or they're just like, hey, whatever? Nah, because I'm with the people that's just like me, so we're just, yeah. there's other people doing worse, you know? There was dudes getting busted for acid, things like that. I, I had more than a good share of friends that ended up in the brig. Luckily, I didn't, but, right. you know, there was guys bringing stuff home from home and all kind of stuff, and... I wasn't doing any of that, you know, but I kept doing this stuff. I started, first time I did acid was in the Marines. Yeah, how, long, how long did you stay in the Marines? Uh, I was in for like two and a half years and I got hurt. Uh, we were uh, out in California in the desert and I was doing this prep thing, you know, getting ready to go away. I ended up getting hurt. And uh, once you're a broken toy in the, tool in the toy box, they don't really play with you anymore. And I just got kind of just like slow tracked my way out of there, you know? Yeah. And I had to what, what, what? How did you get hurt? Like what? I was rappelling from, a, it was a simulation to rappel from a helicopter. Right. So you're out on the skid and you, we had already learned how to rappel and fast rope and all this stuff. And uh, I was doing the simulation and I ended up f sliding down the line, falling, boom, you know, jacked up both my knees, you know, and, you know, it sucked, but in my mind at that time, I was like, all right, well, I'll get out of here and I could go back to doing what I want to do, I guess. Yeah. You know, I didn't see any way to work through or anything like that. It was just like, all right, I guess this is it. Yeah, you tapped out. Yeah, that's all they, you know, they didn't really give you an option. Right. You know, once you're hurt, you know, basically all that could kind of happen to you is you could get hurt further. I know now that you could have powered through. I could have lied. I could have said it didn't hurt and things like that. But I was already in the mix of stuff, and I was like, all right, you know, I guess I fucked this up too. Yeah. How did that make you feel like on the uh, inside? It sucked, man, because when I got home, uh, you know, I felt like a failure. You know, I couldn't even do that. I couldn't even get that right. Right. You know, like, and when I went home, I went right back to the same shit I had left years before. You know, yeah. that guy picked me up in a, in a van off the street corner with all my friends and took me over to, uh, you know, Fort Hamilton to take the test and, and everything like that. And I disappeared. That was it. I was gone. And now, two and a half years later, I come rolling up in a car that I bought because of having, you know, that job. And, but I went right back to that same street corner. If there was a chalk outline of me on the wall, I stepped right back into my role. Those people were still there where I left them, wow. doing the same shit, and I just jumped right back into it. How long did that last? Well, my mom found me like two or three days later arguing with the Chinese food man because I was shit faced. She didn't. I didn't even tell my family I was coming home. My mom found me because I was acting like a drunken asshole up on the up on the corner. Right. She thought I was like uh, called UA unauthorized absence. You know. Some people hear it called a wall, you know. There I am, fucking home. But um, hey, ma. Yeah, yeah. 
wow. believe this guy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So what was that like when, when, uh, when you start getting back into the mix with your family and everybody? Uh, for a while, I just, I, mean, I felt sorry for myself and I just sat around and did nothing. You know, smoked and, you know, uh, drank and, and then, uh, and then I, uh, you know, I got a place with my cousin and a friend of mine, and I started to try to incorporate some of the things that I had learned while I was there and bring it into play on the streets. And, you know, I was doing street shit, you know, but with a new skill set. Yeah, so how, when does the end show up? Well, for... For me, even in that in that instance, you know, I'm out one night drunk with my friends, and uh, you know, a uh, couple of guys try to rob me, and uh, I end up uh, I end up in a, a fight with four guys, and I get stabbed to death, you know. And I tell people I can only tell you it's to death because my mom came to an emergency room at like four o'clock in the morning. And the doctor told her that I was, uh, you know, I had had my, my radial nerve and artery severed and it wouldn't cauterize and I just kept bleeding out, bleeding out. And, and, uh, and then I'm handcuffed to a bed and I'm being arraigned at the bedside and, oh God, please get me out of this one. And, and I'm out of it or temporarily. And I go right back to doing what I always did. You know, I didn't even go right home. I lied to get home. I told them somebody was coming to get me, but I really called a cab. And I didn't even have the cab take me home. I had them take me to the corner store, and I got a 12-pack, and I started drinking and doing whatever drugs I had in the house and feeling bad for myself now because, you know, my arm didn't work anymore. And I only had, a, you know, one arm, one hand that, that operated. Right, not even making the connection. Not at all. Not at all. Not, it took me years to make the connection that I was hurting other people. I didn't think that was hurting my mother by having her come to an ER in the middle of the night. Yeah, a lot of times, like, people don't, like, you don't realize. It's funny because I was talking with my girl today on an, about an unrelated thing. And she was like, one thing, she, she said it, and not, like, in a disrespectful way, but she, the way that you and I think now as sober, recovering men is different than a lot of other people. No offense to you. But she was like, she was saying, she's like, one thing has nothing to do with the other. I was like, oh, no, everything is connected. You know, if I'm, ha if I'm living this kind of life, having these kind of thoughts that make me make these kind of choices, two years down the road, you go from doing all the push-ups with your boys on the fucking thing where you're the stand-up guy to being knifed on the fucking corner to, you know, yeah, I, it's I, all connected. Like I, I never got arrested before. I used to be the one that always got away with shit. And right. I didn't get arrested till I got home. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, you know, it's, you know when, when the end is coming, it's like, it's a surprise. Meanwhile, this, this story, this song has been playing on repeat for a long time. And, like, you can look back and be like, you know, I, you know, I listen to a lot of, like, Jocko. And he's always yeah. talking about, like, you know, you're either building stuff or you're destroying it a little bit at a time. You know? And we don't even realize till like, all the way at the end when somebody's like, same thing. Right? The Marine guy or whatever is like, I can only promise you a different way of life. So when does that moment show up for you where you start to be like, all right, maybe I need to fucking... Well, I, I, I did this little run around, you know, I recovered from that, you know. I, I, I used, like, my will, I guess, or whatever. I, I started doing everything with the left hand until the left hand worked again. Nine months later, it starts working again. They told me it would never work again. Right. And I do this, and but I'm still drinking heavily, and, and all of that drugs and... Uh, you know, I would try and stop, but I couldn't, you know, I, I never equated, uh, you know, any kind of program as being able to help me because my dad went to the programs and, you know, it would work for a while, but there was no permanent solution that I seen in it. So there I am, I'm trying to do it my way. And my way is like, 
unplug the phone, shut off the lights, and hide and hope the world ends, you know? And all that did was make my little sisters have to come get the landlord to let me into the, let them into the house to see if I'm still breathing and things like that, hurting people without even knowing it. And for me, the last straw was really... Um, uh, my dad had ended up back in the program again. Me and him were partying hard together. You know, he's like bouncing at a bar. He, you know, he moved to Pennsylvania. It's like it's like Roadhouse. You know, they have like the the bouncer meeting before. Like how how they gonna officially uh, efficiently kick people's asses and send them on their way and stuff. It's so funny because like I know so many people that that's like the route. It's like. They go Brooklyn, Staten Island, and then PA. Oh, I'm out in PA now. You know, I'm St- East Stroudsburg. <laughs> <laughs> he's in some mining town, and yeah. he thinks he's uh, Patrick Swayze. That's perfect. And, uh, you know, he goes off the deep end, and, you know, I'm trying to help, but I'm getting messed up myself at the time, so I can't really help too much. Right. And, uh, you know, we get him. He's in a jackpot again, and... We we end up getting him out of there. Me and my sister, I had to I had to bear hug him and jump into my car and have my little sister just step on the gas and like go, and she's like, "What if he jumps out? Fuck him if he jumps out, <laughs> you know." And we drove him out of there. And uh, crazy as there's no coincidence, like you were just saying, like we the decisions you make, it's all connected. But sometimes I don't see the connection right away, but I can look back and maybe a year from now and see the connection. And uh, my sister had married a guy, and this guy's dad was in the program for, like, at the time, 20-something years. No fucking way. And he hooked my dad up with a guy that he helped, and that guy started helping my dad. And I seen my dad change. You know, from that night, I'm holding him, and he looked me right in the, you know, drunk and high, looked me right in my face and said, why don't you just let me die? And, you know, I felt like I was stabbed all over again when he said that to me. It was just like, it hurt so bad. Yeah, people think that, that kind of cinematic stuff is like, bro, that's, it's not the same in real life. No, it sucks. It fucking sucks. And, and now I see him starting to get better. And I see the guy that I was getting high with, you know, fighting people with, changing. And I'm like, what's going on here? So you guys got him back to Staten Island. He starts getting cleaned up. Yep. And, uh, you know, I I end up taking him in with me to live, you know, and I'm seeing him do better. So I got a bunch of friends that are fucked up. So I start bringing them around my father, hoping that he could help them. Right. And but I didn't want any help. I'm yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm good. I'm just going to help Sean out. You know, I can, whatever. And, you know, I went as far as, like, to not be drunk around my father. I I uh, packed up and moved to the Dominican Republic for, you know, a couple of months. <laughs> you know, I was flying back and forth. And then I'm like, how much does an apartment cost you? You know, so that I could party and beat me, but not bring it on to him because right. he was doing so good. Yeah, meanwhile, he's probably thinking about you fucking scared to death. I had no idea. I had no idea until uh, one day I'm walking out of my apartment and I hear him and my cousin, who is now also in the program for a bunch of years, and he's having a conversation with my with my dad, and he's like, well, what are you doing? Uh, you're, you're trying to teach him the right thing to do? And my father says... I told him enough of the wrong thing to do, yeah. and it clicked. It clicked for me, and it was like, shit, this guy, he's not pushing anything on me, but he's trying to drag me along with him so that I could see it for myself, and I didn't, and I hung around for a year just sitting in the back, you know, just basically a chauffeur dri- driver for my dad and, uh, you know, uh, you know, making up my own stories, not believing anything that's going on there. And uh, I took my, the last time, the first time I ever seen that I was hurting other people, I take my dad on a, a, a trip for his birthday. I'm back in college. My dad, uh, you know, we go down to, we're going to go down to Miami for a Jet Dolphin game. 
because they both suck, and the only team the Jets could manage to beat at that time is the Dolphins. Right. So I figure, let's get the old man a win for his birthday. And I go, uh, I take him down there and ask a bunch of people, only my other cousin wants to go with us. And uh, at this time, the best I could do is to not be drunk around them is to do it away from them. But I'm not going to do that on vacation. I'm footing the bill, you know. Basically, I, I can tell you now, I thought I was doing the right thing, but I was really just taking my dad to be my chauffeur so I didn't catch a DUI while I was in Miami. And we get there, and the flight's delayed. So in my brain, when I want to be drunk and high, I'm already on vacation. I'm in an airport. That's close enough. Right. I'm going away tomorrow, so I'm starting today. Yeah, me and my cousin, we go into the airport uh, bar, and, uh, you know, we just start drinking, and he's got a couple of little extra goodies that he brought with him for the trip, and I got mine, and we're divvying them up, and Pop is sober, and he's walking around, you know, buying neck pillars and shit like that that people do in the airport when they got a flight delay. He's being a civilian. Yes, 100%. And... uh when we get out of the uh, the airport bar, the flight's finally back on. Me and my cousin are so shit faced. We come out of there, but we tip well. I learned that early on. You know, service family always. You know, you tip well. People take you care. Gotta of you. be heavy handed. <laughs> and we walk out of that airport bar with foam cups, like we just walked out of Farrell's on a Saturday afternoon. And I go up to the guy and. Uh, I give him my ticket and I give him a fucking high five like I'm getting on my own personal like airplane. Right. And, you know, I took a couple of Zannies to take a nap and uh, my cousin didn't. <laughs> and about an hour and a half into maybe two hours into a three hour flight, my, my neighbor wakes me up because the air marshal is questioning my cousin you know, they didn't like the show that he was fucking putting on. Yeah, they didn't buy tickets. No, no, no. They weren't appreciating the comedy that was coming to, coming their way. And, uh, you know, I come out of it, and I think, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I talk this guy down. You know, I think I try to mind trick this guy. You know, like, there's nothing to see here. And he goes back to his thing. My cousin calms down. And when we land, the tactical force boards the airplane. This guy had called ahead, you know, and... Of course. And there's a... You know, they had riot shields and helmets and pistols out on the crowded airplane. Like, uh, I tell people, like, like Osama bin Laden was sitting in row eight. And they just fucking converged on my cousin. And they didn't even want to arrest me. They just came in. They were going to get him, drag him off. But when I'm drunk and I'm high, I can't mind my own business. And... Like, I asked the one guy in my row, what are you arresting him for? He says, none of your business. What do you want to get locked up to? I said, for asking, poof, I'm in handcuffs. And then I become the fucking Hulk. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, you want to lock me up, buddy? Now take me off the plane. <laughs> and, and I don't know how they did it to this day. Fucking, they, they got into my row. They picked me up by my belt and my pants leg. And they fucking ran me down the carpet like I was a vacuum cleaner. Nice. And I, uh, you know. My, they were trained. Yes, my mugshot had like a road rash. Like I fell off my bike and slid down fucking down the highway for about a quarter mile. And uh, I get out onto the jetway and and there's my cousin. They're yoking him up. They got him like, it looked like the, the old camel clutch. <laughs> They're yeah, fucking yeah, trying yeah. to pop his head off. I'm handcuffed. I'm still mouthing off to these cops, you know. And I said to the guy, I said, what are you going to do, tough guy? Shoot me with your taser? And a light bulb went off over his head. He didn't even remember he had the taser. He fucking pulls the taser out. Boom. Shoots me right in the back. The fucking wires come flying out. I'm, boom. I'm on the ground. But it didn't hurt because I'm high and I'm drunk. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, is that all you got, tough guy? You better crank that shit up because I'm coming for you. <laughs> and he just turned the gun and turned the dial, cranked it up. Boom, blasted me again, flat out, but still running my mouth. I got blasted another time. The only thing that stopped me was... One thing was the partner looked like he was going for the Glock. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, they're going to fucking shoot me right here in the jetway. And the other thing was I looked up the ramp, a brief thing, and it was almost like fucking a spotlight from heaven shined down on this. 
here's my father. He's trying to record it on his like Motorola flip phone to oh, gather right. evidence for a police brutality case, and they're fucking locking him up too. And oh. here's my father trying to be sober, trying to be a citizen, and he's getting fucking locked up because I'm a fuck up. And that was that was what that was it for me. That was like. You're hurting other people, bro. You're not just having the good time and everybody's trying to fucking ruin your good time. Yeah, that was the moment when it all clicks. That's when I needed. And it wasn't that simple, but I started going back with my father and paying a lot more attention to what was going on. And, you know, a little assistance from, you know, my federal probation officer and things like that, you know, being a little scared. Did you have to get, uh, were you, do you have to get sheets signed? Uh, I didn't have to get a sheet signed, but I did, rem- I, I was, the, the lady did a good job of checking up on me. Right. I tried staying ahead of the game, like, let's not get mandated, I'll tell the lady I already go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm carrying around literature like like it's a, uh, you know, fucking crucifix. I'm fighting off uh, Dracula. And I don't need to go there. Look, look, you know, and never opening it once to see what's in there. And uh, I uh, I end up going in there and I sat in on a meeting one night. And some guy says, hey, you know, why don't you help out? And I was like, in my brain, I'm like, fuck you, help out. <laughs> you know, like, I'm here. That's all the help you're getting. I'm driving this asshole home later, <laughs> you know? But when he did, I said yes, and I just did it. Magically. Yeah, yeah. Just something in me said say yes. Yeah. And then, you know, before long, I'm sitting there. I'm actually starting to hear what's coming out of people's mouth. And... I asked the guy to help me. And I, it was the hardest thing I ever did, but also it was like, I said to myself, I said, the best time, somewhere along that line, it equated, the most successful I've had in my life up to this point was listening to somebody else. You know, it was in boot camp. So I'll listen to this idiot for a little bit. <laughs> you know, see where, where it goes. And not thinking anything would work for me was the best thing that I could have done. You know, it did work because I didn't think it would. Yeah. But I did it 100% the way I was told to. I didn't try fucking, you know, adding an extra egg to the cake, you know, or anything like that. You know, I like fucking icing, you know. Like, I made the cake the way the guy told me to, and that's the only reason why I think I'm, 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 I'm still baking. <laughs> yeah, know? and it's been a long time. Yeah, yeah. You just celebrated, no? Mm-hmm. How long? Uh... 14 years. That's a long time. 14 years, no drinking, no drugging, you know, like, that's a miracle. What's it been like for you? Over the years, early on, it was good, you know, like, I got introduced to a whole new way of life, you know. Similar to what the recruiter said. Yeah, 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 whole nother way of life, and there I am, you know, eventually, you know, this guy's basically just dragging me along with him, doing what he does, and then... You know, one of those guys that I started dragging around by my dad early on, he had a nephew, and the nephew asked me if I could help him. And I said, well, you know, I can only show you what I did, and and boom, I'm helping somebody else. And me and my dad are dragging the kid around with us doing, like, you know, we're going to, like, the Golden Gloves, and we're going to, like, Wu-Tang. Me and my dad, we became, like, running partners in the beginning of, like, cool shit. You know, like, I, I didn't know much about the blues, you know. My father's a big, like, mu- you know, music guy. So now I'm going to see B.B. King, and I'm dragging my dad to go see Wu-Tang. And, right. and my dad's going to, my dad's got a fucking Wu-Tang tattoo now, you know. It's so funny. And we're dragging the kid with us. And, and it's making sense to me now. I just did it because I had to do it at first. And then when I started doing it with him, I was like, shit, this works. This is working, you know. And if all- you think about your relationship, like this guy ate his dinner in another room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we're eating dinner together. Now you're like, you, you get him locked up, like the whole thing. And then now 
the relationship is like, he lives across the hall from me. You know, I got him an apartment. I couldn't deal with him in my apartment. Right, right. So he went away one weekend and I, I, the people moved out and he came back and he came in my place and he's like, oh, what's going on? I was like, well, you live across the hall now, <laughs> you know, right. and he had his own apartment. Right. Yeah. And then over time, like, what did you, what did you learn about yourself by, you know, you like me, heavily involved in the program, doing the step work, helping other people, the whole shit, the whole life changing things that, you know, we come to find out we were joking before the thing where I was just like, oh, I hit the step four. I found out not only am I a junkie drunk, but I'm a fucking piece of shit, too. <laughs> so I got to change the way that I behave uh, because I see other people doing it. And then eventually it changes the way that I think and how I feel. So once you start doing that, you start to look back. I'm like, holy shit. I've been, I've been using the same fucking goggles, rusty ass goggles about how life and how the world works my whole life. And this is like, so like, you know, I, I had no clue. You right. Know? I was brought up on, uh, survival skills. Sure. And then I realized that my survival skills would, character defects you know right. like what the fuck and you're very def you defend the drink you defend it like you defend it like no 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 i'm fucking you know and then so what did you learn about yourself that really surprised you once you started to really to get to know about yourself and what about yourself did you really want to change i pretty much wanted to change everything you know early on i went back to after like about two years or so, uh, my dad's sponsor had, had, had passed, you know, and... Uh, that must have been tough for him, it too. It was tough for him, and a uh, guy that uh, was helping me was also in that same lineage. Right. And, uh, you know, I had to, you know, I, I was doing it on my own again. And I was starting to realize, like, I was making the same shitty fucking mistakes that I was before, but under the guise of, you know, something's guiding me to this stuff. Right. You know, I'm, I'm such a piece of shit without that guidance that, you know, I end up, uh, you know, in a relationship with an ex-girlfriend that, you know, at that time happened to be married. Right. You know, and all under the guise is that I'm a good guy and I'm trying to help her out. You know, I'm not helping anybody. I'm helping me. But I'm thinking that it's guiding me to that, not... Right, like this is what life presents to you, so I guess this is what I should be doing. Yeah, I'm following the path, ain't uh, I? Yeah. You know, and... Um, uh, it's like we're growing up. Yeah, I'm go I go back to... I start to replace going uh, to, like, the rooms with going back to MMA, and now I'm, like, cage fighting, and... I'm doing all kind of shit I shouldn't be doing, right. and uh, it 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 starts to unravel. And for me, you know, I end up uh, in the hospital about three years in uh, with gall uh, gallstones and whatnot. And um, I end up going there. It's like uh, they give me some medicine. I'm good. I had this problem the whole time that I was drinking and using. I thought I was just like catching like food poisoning and shit like that here and there or I just overdid it last night now they're saying no this is the problem and you're gonna have to get it out and I'm like all right cool you know they give me a date and full of fear doing it on my own uh I end up convincing the doctor you know me and the old man we go to see Prince in Madison Square Garden and it's amazing the guy is amazing and uh, so he does, he announces he's doing another date uh, a month later. So I get tickets for that, and I convince this doctor that it's better for me to go see Prince, and we push this operation off, and that's what I do. And the doctor's like, yeah, you know, uh, he, he's playing with uh, Maceo, who played, like, I think trumpet for James Brown. Yeah, you definitely should be there. And... <laughs> and uh, so now um, at, uh, I delay it, and by the time I finally get the surgery, uh, my gallbladder ruptures on the operating table, and uh, they have to cut me from, like, 
the middle of my chest all the way down to my the side. Yeah, old school. All That's my organs have to be taken out because this bile, you know, shit shutting down. And I end up dead again under my own volition. You know, supposedly living a new life by a program. But uh, I wake up hours later and, you know, now I'm intubated, you know. And all, but, but in that time I come to. And unlike the other time, I'm like, shit, things didn't go the way they were supposed to. But at the same instance, I'm like, shit, I guess I'm supposed to be here for a reason. And uh, I didn't I didn't even want to know what the reason was. I just knew that there was a reason I'm still alive and I'm not dead because my own mm. shit is what's getting me to be, you know, I'm dying under my own uh, right, right. under my own actions. So I come back in full force and start doing all that shit I was told to do. Uh, one of the guys that come up and visited me, was a guy that I respect that started helping me and he still helps me to this day, you know? And that's all I do. I do this stuff, you know, that I've been taught to do. And I've been able to help other people, you know? I've been able to help myself. I've been able to be there for my family, you know? Uh, I took my mom on a cruise for like a 60th birthday and the scariest thing about it leading up to the thing that I would share was not that I was worried about drinking, but that I was going to be a piece of shit son to my mom. Yeah. Because that's, that's what I do. I, I take my frustrations out on the people closest to me. Yeah. You know, and I've got to be a good person. I got to meet people just like me on that cruise boat. And fucking have a great time. Yeah, I heard they have meetings on the cruise. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just gotta they they use the like the keywords and shit like that, and you look it up in the. Uh, That's so funny. In, in the uh, itinerary, and there it is. You know, oh, my friends are in the uh, the cabin, the captain's stateroom tonight. You know, and you go so funny. <laughs> I was telling you like um because I I talk a lot about my my one of my sponsors, Free Willy. He's. He's only not my sponsor now because he moved away. Um, but, I mean, I love him. He's still, he's like consigliere, <laughs> right? So, like, he, like, loves going on cruises. And he went on this cruise. And we were joking, like, yeah, maybe you should go to, uh, go to a meeting on a cruise. He's like, yeah, I'll find one. It was, like, his first cruise that he went on. I remember. It was, like, so long ago. And um, he finds the meeting. And on that cruise, we're, like, 25 people from like Bronx County AA <laughs> on this fucking cruise to Mexico. So he met all these people who do service below the group level in the Bronx at the and then like he got plugged in there. He's like it was unreal. Yeah. You know, I've, we're everywhere. I've had that experience in other countries just going into room. Yeah, you know, I went with a buddy of mine to Bermuda and I jump on a scooter and I fucking walk through a cemetery and find a place, <laughs> you know, with people just like me. And for me, that was an eye-opener because there was only, like, uh, I think eight meetings on the island a week. Wow. So I, I started to realize, like, the petty shit that goes on where people will just up and leave and stop going. If you live in a place where there's a limited supply... You fucking deal with your shit, and you you know you can't harbor that resentment. Yeah, you learn how to play nice. Exactly, because your life depends on it. Right, and the thing is, it's not like you know, it's, it's like you know the the thing about alcoholism and addiction, whether it could be food, it could be anything. You know, it's all in the same thing. It's like our inability to deal with life, and people, you know, like people are like, oh, because you drink a lot. It's like no, it's just. It's like an, I'm an alcoholic and an addict because I now is different, but my natural state is uh, irritation. That's my na if you leave me alone and I don't do any um, any interaction with other sober people and I don't live the life that I live, eventually I'll be irritated all the time. Everything irritates me because I cannot stand life sober. Like I can't it's unbearable to me. So that's why I drank and did drugs and did all the woman womanizing everything, all the stuff that I've done. But like, 
it takes time to like rebuild your life away from that stuff. And you get so much more out of this other life, you know, that it's one of the things that troubles me is, um, you know, people, we use this term, don't quit before the miracle happens. And like, it's, it's so debilitating because sobriety is whatever, but recovery, like having a good life, it requires legitimacy. It requires Frank to be as honest as Frank can be with every person in his path. It doesn't mean that you're fucking Johnny Appleseed, whatever, but you're doing the best that you can. And the more that you live life like that and make those kinds of choices, eventually life is really fucking good. But like the the more you start putting these little post-its on there, a little by the way, or I'm going to cut this corner and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It all, it shows up on the operating table with the bile, you know, at, at, at the fucking... I had my gallbladder taken out, and they did it through the belly button. I got those scars because it was supposed to go down yeah, like yeah. that. And the guy was like this, and I was young. I mean, I got sober. I was 24, so I was about 30, maybe a little bit less than 30. And I was having these gallstone attacks. And then when they come, whoever has them, you know. They fucking come, right? So I, I drove myself to the hospital, and they were like, oh, we have to take it out. And they're like, you're a little bit young to be having this. And I was like, well, what is... What does a gallbladder do? They're like, oh, it produces bile that goes into your stomach, helps you digest food. And I was like, yeah. I said, well, you know, I'm an addict, and uh, I was throwing up bile every day for two years for breakfast. So he's like, well, I guess that's how you did it, you know? And then they took it out, and it was funny because, like, even when I went for the follow-ups, like, they, this was, like, before now, they do all these, like, lap band surgeries for people to lose weight. But people do that. They get their gallbladder taken out because you, you have to eat less. You can't eat a lot at one time. So I, I was in, the, I was in the, the waiting room for the follow-up with, like, all these big, fat ladies who were like, what the hell is this skinny guy doing? I was like, it's like I'm a junkie, <laughs> and I, I fucked my shit up. And they were, like, laughing and, you know, but it's a whole new life, you know. What's it like with your dad today? Uh, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, like, you know, uh, it's crazy because... At, at one point, you know, my father didn't have that guy to guide him anymore. Never got another guy. Got a bunch of friends that kind of like basically just co-signed his shit. And, but never had that serious, like, I'm going to be honest with this guy about every little thing that bothers me. So the success went out the window. And eventually, you know, he's worked. He's been injured. You know, he has everything wrong with him. You know, I was telling a guy the other day, my father's like fucking evil Knievel. He's got so many broken this, that, and he, So for a while, he was just like getting the scripts but not eating them. And then right. he slowly started taking his own prescribed meds, and he ended up back out there. And like my, my cousin says all the time, the, the drug of no choice will lead you back to your drug of choice every time. And 100%. he ended up shit-faced, you know, pissing himself, you know, making, you know, uh, his own, uh, like, Jaeger bombs, but in his mouth rather than in a cup. So there's Red Bulls and Jaeger Meister bottles all over. And, uh, you know, I was worried, and I asked the guy that's helping me, and I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, you just keep doing what you're doing and you be there for him when he wants your help. Yeah, when he's ready. And try to explain that to people, that, my sisters, that aren't like us. And they're like, you got to help him. And I'm like, I can't. You, you know, what, what we need to do is not be there when he wakes up this next time after his run in the hospital. And eventually they caught on and they left him. And he woke up, and there was only a doctor there, and the doctor suggested detox, and he went, and I, uh, I, I called, uh, you know, the guy at our union that helps us, and got him into a, another facility, and he went away again. And about three weeks in, the guy goes and visits him, and he's he's running the show there, and everything's right. great, and the guy's like, eh, I think you might maybe I could get you cleared for like another week or two. 
nah, I'm good. I'm coming home. Like 10 days later, he's five days later, he's back in the hospital. 10 days later, he's back in detox. Yeah. And he asked me to help him and I drove him and I took him there and I took him to, uh, he went to another rehab and uh, then we suggested he go to a sober house and he went and I went every weekend and drove him to stop and shop so that he could replenish the fridge and fucking the dollar store and, and supported him in that way. But for him, he came back home, he completed an, an outpatient program. I suggested maybe just to keep yourself busy, go to an outpatient here too. Yeah, we know you completed, so he did that. But slowly he pulled away. He never went back to the groups. He, he didn't have that in him to, to tell those people he failed. But not realize that by you telling those people you failed, you're, right, you're, helping, them. you're helping them to be aware that it could be waiting for you around the corner. And, uh, you know, he did that for a little while, but he pulled away. And he ended up having to go again. And he just, cel uh, you know, he just celebrated a year himself uh, back in November. And I got to be there for him the same way that he was there for me. And now he lives in my house. Him and my uncle live in my house, you know. And I only have that house because, you know, a bad run in the family a couple of years ago. You know, my uncle, who I love, uh, he, uh, he married a woman that was just like us. Even my uncle's like us, but... But he found relief through, through going to church and sure. things like that, which is great. You know, he'd been through the program. He knew the, the, the ins and outs of it. He knew where to, you know, don't hang out in a barbershop if you don't want a haircut. Yeah, like people, that. places, and things. And he did all of that. He found a new group of people. And, but his wife was trying to stop, and she tried quitting benzos and alcohol, oh, cold turkey. Fuck. And at 50, you could die. 52 years old, she had a, a seizure in her sleep and died laying yeah. next to him. And less than a year later, uh, my aunt died of a cirrhotic liver because of, not, not because of this, but because of, uh, she was an epileptic. Right. And she took, you know, the pills her yeah. whole life. Yeah. And uh, she passed away and he ended up... Uh, taking care of her kids. He was like the guy. So now here he is. He's taking care of his wife's mother because he made an honorable man. Honorable, the, I would love to have the, the honor that this man carried himself with. And he, uh, he told his wife that he wouldn't allow her mother to end up in a, a, a nursing home. Right. So he changed this lady's diapers. You know, he... he he did everything. He took care of my aunt's kids. They're living with him now. And then the lady passes away and her other kids and everything, they, you know, the house was on one of them reverse mortgages and it was costing money. And she ended up, uh, they ended up selling the house and he's ready to move into a, an apartment with my two cousins, you know, and... The amount of money you got to come up with for like a fucking three bedroom apartment in Bay Ridge, and uh, he's kind of like down, and it's not a guy that you really see, like show emotion, you know. He's not that guy. And I go into his house one night, and he's talking about, well, yeah, I'm gonna have to get rid of the cats. His wife fucking brought home she she adopted two cats by going and helping a friend one time at right. one of those adoptions. And then, like, two, three years later, she adopted three more. Yeah, it's all it takes. Yeah, so now he's got five cats, and he's got to give the cats away, you know? And that's his connection to his wife. Mm. And their dog that they shared that she also brought home already just passed. And I see all the herd on him, and I tell him, well, let me find out about this, uh, this VA mortgage, and maybe we can get a house. Not meaning that I really wanted to do that. I just knew it was the right gesture. But to be an honorable man like he was, I had to step up and do it. And I got a house and brought them to live with me. And we're playing like a, a fucking crazy version of a Full House, me and this guy, so trying to raise like two teenagers. And uh, oh, 
like a year and a half ago, maybe maybe two years ago now, he comes home, he tells me, uh, uh, the doctor found something, and I got cancer, but it's not a bad kind of cancer, and I uh, just got to do this chemo, and, and he does it, and he works every day and while he's doing it, and eventually uh, it gets to the point where he has to do the surgery, and... Uh, and he ends up, uh, it doesn't go good. You know, he almost loses his leg. I, you know, the doctor calls me and asks me if it's okay to take his leg. I'm like, what? Well, you're the proxy. You know, like, yeah. shit I'm not prepared for. But I call other people that I know from this program, and they, they, they help me through their own real experiences. You know, luckily the guy that helps me, he's a nurse in an oncology department. And he's able to coach me through that, too. And comes time, he's ready to come home on hospice. And uh, he's able to come home to the house that we provided, you know. And, you know, and I'm able, through the help of all the people that I met, get real-life advice. The guy that helped me, I never, I heard him talk in front of a room one time. And I didn't really know him well. But he described the exact thing I was about to go through, and I sought the guy out. And the guy coached me through everything I was about to experience. And I got to do that with the honor that this man had. You know, I got to change colostomy bags and hold piss bottles and change wounds and shit that I'm not equipped for. Dignity. Yeah, yeah, to provide this man with a, 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 a good end, as best as that end could be. And he took it better than all of us. And, uh, you know, to be able to be there, you know, at that last moment yeah. was it. And then to prepare the service. All shit that, that me, drunk and high, is run. incapable oh, of. Oh, yeah. you run from that. I'm, in the, I'm, in, I'm crying about how sad it is at the bar, at the bar drinking with assholes. you not even there, yeah. You know, I'm not even helping. Right. But the people got me through it. The people that I, and for me, that's the prize. You know, if nothing else ever comes from this, that was what it was all for. That, that could be the only reason I woke up from that surgery. And if that's it, I'm fucking totally good with it. Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all, uh, it's all connected. You know, I think, you know, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up, but it was like, you know, when you really find, you know, when you really find God and you're like, his, my job is to allow him to prepare me to be there for other people. Not to control them. Like when people are like, oh, with your dad and you were like, my job is to be there with, and love him when he's ready. That's not, my job is not to fucking make him get sober or any, like, same thing. Like, with this gentleman, even with my kids, with all this other stuff. My job is, like, you know, listen, and I'm, you know, I'm forceful in ways where I'm, like, trying to share my experience with them. I'm, like, you know, I've, I'm, I've just been around the sun more times than them. I'm not smarter than them, you know. I just have more experience. Like, hey, dog, if you start cutting school in ninth grade and smoking weed by the fucking pier, you know what I mean? It's going to be this. I just know because I've been there. So, like, but then to to have that change of from going to wanting to control everything and to letting other people help you just be there, that's, like, the whole that's why we're here. That's it. You might get a, a house or a car or a girl or whatever you... The, when I heard people say life beyond your wildest dreams, my wildest dreams when I came in here was to be sitting on the back of a yacht with Puff Daddy and Biggie Smalls and yeah. girls dancing around and we're smoking blunts and whatnot, you know. Now I know what they meant because I wasn't even capable of dreaming those dreams. Yeah. And it's almost like, it's almost like, like all of those like tenants that they speak about in the Marines. Right. 
but it didn't work out for you there, but then it worked out for you here where you're like a fucking, you're just a stand-up human being, you know? And you 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 took the fucking long way around. <laughs> <laughs> you took the fucking, you took the local. Yeah. But you got, to, you know, to be there for somebody like that is like, you know, to even have that opportunity, it's like, it's got to be, it's got to be very rewarding. Like you said, even with you, with your, uh, with your kids and stuff that I got nieces and nephews and they're kids and they do the thing that kids do. And, and I just tell them like, don't overdo it. Yeah, you yeah. know, like, uh, like they say, no, you can't go back to being a cucumber. Don't right. cross the imaginary line. I have no idea where I crossed it, but I a hundred percent crossed it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm stuck here. Don't get stuck here. Yeah. Cause we got chairs that you can sit in. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. And, 100%. but, you know, and, you know, I remember taking those kids, you know, two of my nieces on a cruise, you know, and go into those rooms. And they're like, you still have to do that? I says, I do that because this is what enables me to take you guys here now. Plus Your mother wouldn't even let it. me watch you. Right. <laughs> you know, now she let me take you guys to another country, you yeah. know? And that's why I do it. You and know? plus now you want to. Oh, 100%. Hundred percent, you know, like, and I'm still a, a maniac, you know. Sure. We're, we're jumping in the ocean at you every know Sunday. crazy degrees <laughs> every Sunday. Yo, I send my cousins pictures like when I do it, and they're like, they don't. One of them didn't believe it was me. They're like, "There's no way you're in that water." I'm like, "Yeah," and I'm like, and I'm like a little baby because I'm teachable. I'm like, "No, no, I'm like a, I'm a polar bear cub. I'm not a bear yet. I'm like, I'm being sponsored into the polar bears. I'm a cub, and like." You know, it's nice to be like that. I can, um, I can be a white belt in there. You know, that's my whole life. Where people can be like, "Oh, well, you have this business, you have these things, and you have, you know, this amount of sobriety." And there's other people in there who are in that thing, who are in our program, and they're like, "Yeah, they may look at me like I'm a big deal inside the room, but here, like, bro, no, you're helping me. I don't know what fucking neoprene to buy, like, whatever, like." You know, that's just another tool that doing that, jumping in the water. Yeah. It's just another tool for me that that gets me through this, because if I'm going through, I, I need sometimes I need to create the struggle. No, but I, I need I, to I know the experience because I found you only find out, the, you know, the only way to find out where you made of is to test yourself. Yeah. And I, I'm not doing it alone. I'm doing it. I knew when I was going out there, I was like, dude, you know, Ammer and everybody else, they're not going to let me drown. And there's lifeguards there, and that's it. How many people ask you, why do you do it? Oh, my God. <laughs> why do you got to do it 12 times? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I just say, look, I, you know, I love it. Yeah. It's, it's nothing better, nothing better. It's 100%. And, and like you said, with the people that, uh, you know, that, that, that walk away before the miracle, yeah. sometimes those people don't even realize they're already experiencing the miracle. Yeah. They, they walk away. There's people I've helped that, that have gotten the, the cash and prizes yeah. and walked away from it, you know, the, the, because they didn't, they didn't see it. Other people saw it, but we're the last ones to know. Just like I'm the last one to know that I'm a fucking drunken drug addict, yeah. you know, and I'll do something about it. Awesome. All right. Well, look, we're going to wrap up. Frank, thanks again. Um, you guys, you know where to find us on uh, Spotify, Apple, The Spiritual Experience. It says with J. Lewis, even though you guys know who I am. And um, like, subscribe, share with everybody. We'll see you on the next time. Peace. Thank you. We want to thank you all for joining us today. And please don't forget to like and subscribe on all podcast platforms. And find us on Facebook where you can become part of our family. We'll see you around.